I started with the hill garden, um, making the first beds in uh, 94 and um, actually the very first garden bed was in front of the carriages and um, oh heavens oh I miss this guy uh, mm, a little purple or oh, 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 I should have picked it two days ago two or three days ago uh, nature doesn't wait nature calls the shots that's what it's like to be a gardener you're never in control nature's in control and you work with her after i've been teaching permaculture for a few years back in the 80s i started to get rather frustrated uh, with um, a lot of the venues that I needed to hire and my dream was to create a permaculture education centre. Uh, not just a great building for training in but a, a living learning environment with a, what I call a living classroom uh, surrounding it and so Janbung Gardens is uh, essentially the realisation of that dream. So the dams were built, the carriages were moved on, uh, we built a roof over one of the carriages with a small water tank so we'd have uh, drinking water for being able to live here and uh, sorted out electricity and uh, things like that and uh, then we moved on so once we had a water supply we could live here. Yeah. Another tip. Another tip or another? another? Tip. Oh, there's lots of tips. And uh, pumpkin tips to go in the tagine. You used to put little eyes on them and make them go <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there's one there. So, uh, yeah, yeah, just back behind there. We have that there. there. Yep. Cool. Should be soft enough. The ones on the ground before we tread on them. I was given the name platypus and there are two Bunjalung names for the platypus. There's Janbang and there's Maramaru, but Uncle Eric says it needs to be platypus whether you call it platypus, Maramaru or Janbang, it's up to you. The platypus is, I suppose in a way, the symbol of this place, the spirit of what we do. a nuisance this weed and it's very hard to get it on through the summer it's just a constant job keeping it at bay and didn't have it until I uh, came in might have come in with some mulch about 15 years ago and it's just taking over Anyway, we use it as mulch for the bush foods in the food forest. When we look at the activities that support human culture, human civilization, it's not only the food that you need and the water, you need your technology, your communications, you need people that grow fibers and make fabrics and make clothes and shoes and you know you need your healers and I mean think through all the things that we need as a society Permaculture looks at how we can actually bring these things together. We're, we're faced with such big problems and big global issues. And a large part of that is that We've lost control of things locally and as communities, uh, relinquished it to big corporations, big governments. And um, this aspect of permaculture is about reclaiming uh, community, reclaiming control. 
and we can find really good examples from the not too distant past uh, of how communities you know manage their own employment funds and manage their own sickness funds and actually looked after each other um, through hard times and uh, I think we're seeing a resurgence of this so uh, that aspect of uh, permaculture often comes under the umbrella of bioregionalism, bioregional design, um, social permaculture. Here we're on the southern edge of the caldera. Uh, the mountains just to the north of us is the southern uh, caldera rim. Uh, the Nightcap Range and uh, some of the the World Heritage Forests up there are hotspots of biodiversity for the subtropics. The Bunjalung story of our local river, the Richmond River, uh, starts up on that mountain. The journey of the Gowana from those mountains there down through the country uh, describes the path of the river and where it originally came out at Evans Head and uh, there you've got uh, Goanna Headland and also in the Evans River there is the uh, Snake Island and so the legend is that the Goanna and the snake had a big fight there and so you know the, the whole countryside is uh, dotted with these stories, like uh, Nimbin comes from the Nimbinj, which were the small, hairy, wise people, and uh, forest dwellers. And so there's all these beautiful stories about them and how they fought with the big people from the coast who tried to take over the country and uh, negotiated um, a, a peace and a settlement with them. And um, it's, yeah. It's uh, interesting and you can sort of see parallels with things that have happened in modern days and as um, you know, Bodhi Jerome uh, would say, look, these aren't just story of stories of what happened once upon a time. It's sort of, it's the spirit of the place. One of the things that really attracted me to this area and made me feel very comfortable about uh, living near Nimbin was the sense of community here. And Nimbin in many ways is like a community of communities. And that really resonates deeply with permaculture uh, because permaculture is beyond just looking after yourself. Uh, we don't talk about self-sufficiency because it's a very selfish thing. We're social animals. So in permaculture we uh, talk about self-reliance, which is a relative thing, and where we can really achieve a high degree of uh, self-reliance is actually on that community level. In 73, there was the Aquarius Festival held in Nimbin, which was a, a celebration and exploration of alternatives and sustainable living, architecture, health and food, and um, just so many things. I think a lot of it was really driven by the way through the 60s and early 70s our old traditional sense of community was really being lost uh, through this sort of newfound uh, consumerism and um, just the way things were, were, were going.
Okay, so this is the community centre. Um, people from the wider community often hire this for workshops and uh, things. There's a shed over there that's got the firefighting equipment and slasher and mower and all that sort of stuff. There's no connection to town water or sewerage, so uh, there's a minimum 40,000 litre rainwater storage requirement per lot. Um, and everybody's treating their own wastewater on site. Most lots have composting toilets. There's just a couple with uh, flush toilets. One of the things that we also lobbied for uh, during the 80s was a new form of land tenure, which uh, enabled uh, community development, as in you know a land sharing community, but where people actually had freehold title for their individual lots, and a legal framework for the management of the community land and resources. And uh, the New South Wales government called this community title. And I was up in this area from 1989 looking for uh, a place to buy land to set up my permaculture centre, but also wanted it to be somehow or other in association with at least, you know, some small hamlet or some form of uh, intentional community or uh, community infrastructure and I was uh, offered the opportunity to design a property here on the edge of Nimbin village uh, now called Jalambar and it became New South Wales first community title. So it has 43 half acre lots on 33 acres of community land uh, that is collectively managed and uh, Janbun Gardens is right next door so uh, it's, it's a nice feeling to have designed your own neighbourhood and I've got all wonderful uh, neighbours up there. People from Jalambar, they, they can wander through Janbun Gardens as a shortcut to town and I'm welcome to go up onto Jalambar and I think, you know, ultimately community is about being good neighbours. I went overseas in my early 20s. I was overseas for five years. I was absolutely fascinated by the different traditional forms of agriculture. So this was before permaculture, but uh, this really seriously influenced my thinking. And my dream was to come back to Australia and get some land and set it up like a botanical gardens of useful plants that are put together in a similar way to how you find them in nature. Um, I arrived back in Australia in 1977 and there was um, an in, uh, organic festival just out of Sydney and one of the speakers there was Bill Mollison and he was promoting the soon-to-be-published first permaculture book. It was really exciting listening to him because he was articulating a lot of these ideas I had and they had a name, they had a methodology. I couldn't wait to get the book when it came out and subscribe to the permaculture magazine and then got the second permaculture book when it came out and tried out many of the ideas on the property. And then in 1983, I went and did the permaculture design course and uh, that really pulled it together for me. And uh, the following year, um, 84, I moved to Sydney because I really wanted to help get permaculture established in the city. Then I got to know Bill Mollison personally and he encouraged me and he became my mentor uh, for the next um, 10 years or so. Over the years, uh, Bill and I worked very closely on uh, many projects and uh, when I moved up here in the late 80s, 89, uh, Bill was living in the Tweed Valley, uh, not far away, and so we used to teach on each other's courses and uh, he was a, a really, really important influence in my life, sort of like a, a father, an uncle, a friend. And Bill Mollison talks about um, pattern learning and linear, or pattern information systems and linear information systems. So our writing is very much linear, okay? 
and our numbers, you know, we sort of do things in columns and across in lines and they're great for storage but hopeless for remembering. Hmm? And so all this information has been embedded in forms that are easy for us to remember. And so our brain has actually been wired to these methodologies for learning and remembering through human history until we, you know, sort of forgotten about it and become very much dependent on the written word. I'm just going to give you a few cards each and I'll come around again with a few more. You know, find ones that have got other categories yeah. and, and, and start moving a few around and see the patterns within the patterns. Do you know what that is, by the way? No. It's a butterfly egg. Oh, wow. And this is also a butterfly egg. Wow. Bill saw in me a person that uh, was very capable of teaching. His encouragement and mentorship uh, was really valuable. Um, there weren't very many people, um, well, weren't very many women uh, who were taking, um, some, I suppose, leadership roles. Uh, I also note that women are really at the forefront with a lot of community work in permaculture. And even here in my own village of Nimbin, uh, a lot of the major initiatives, uh, community initiatives here towards sustainability and addressing social issues as well as environmental issues are actually, um, you know, women are at the forefront. Oh, look at the taro. I mean, that's really loving uh, the weather. If I walked in there, I would be lost. It's been a very difficult season for the garden. But still, even, you know, it's one of the joys of having such diversity in the garden. No matter what the season, there's always something to harvest. So I can eat my way around the planet with the seasons here and get some of those fresh ingredients that just give those authentic flavours fresh from the garden. And oh, the smell is just divine. And there's the delights to come in autumn with my turmerics and uh, the yacon, the Peruvian ground apple. And um, the chocos have just started. We harvest our first chocos this morning. The poor basil's been really hammered. You can see it's just not happy at all with all the rain. So with permaculture, uh, as we sort of noted yesterday, the foundation, think of it as a foundation, okay? If we're building something, we want a good foundation. And our foundation are the ethics. Hmm? I see myself and our species as just one in a beautiful, magical network of, of nature and interrelationships. And for me, it's really important to be coexisting with the wildlife 
and see them as an integral part of the system. And I actually see them as belonging here long before I, myself. You know, the, the wallabies, they've got a few favourite vegetables, so I just have to protect them if I want to eat lettuce and beans. Uh, but, you know, they will be happily in the garden munching on weeds and other things. And in my garden, I've got ponds for the frogs and the lizards, and I have a lot of flowers in the garden for the beneficial insects. And in spring, when all the uh, winter veggies, especially the mustard greens, uh, shoot up and go to flower and seed, uh, they'll inevitably you know, attract um, aphids, and they'll be covered in aphids. And then, if you're patient, uh, after about a week, you start to see ladybirds everywhere and the ladybird larvae that can eat like, you know, a hundred or more aphids a day. Uh, they're avaricious in their appetite. So uh, it's just, you know, a matter of time and observation and uh, being patient and uh, nature does the work for you. And the bees, yes, my bees are a very important part of the system and uh, we need the bees for pollination and of course the big bonus of having a bee friendly landscape is the beautiful honey we get. And did you know a bee in its entire lifetime only produces one teaspoon of honey? So every teaspoon of honey you put in your cup of tea represents the life's work of one little bee. Respect. And what they don't eat will end up in the compost. So. Yeah, I experienced a lot of spaces that worked in some ways and definitely didn't work in others. So uh, a lot of those reflections went into the design of our training centre and I'm actually very happy with it. And somewhere to house my library. It's so easy to just Google something and yet, you know, if electricity fails, if the internet fails, if our satellites get bombed out with a you know, solar flare and these things are all possible, we won't have any information unless we've got books. And so my library is my investment in the future. And it's got just about everything we need in there. It's got books on building, on health, on trees, on animals, on uh, community. I, I love my library. And for me, that is a legacy and a gift for the future. And, um, yeah.
Yeah. Good stuff. So um, after a few hours of playing with compost and playing in the garden, you know, I can be grinning like a Cheshire cat and, <laughs> and, 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 and I had a friend come around once. Oh, oh, Robin, who is he? And I thought, what? Who is he? You got a new flame? And I went, no. She said, well, why are you grinning like that? I thought, oh, I've just been in the garden. <laughs> Around 2007, I came and started doing admin down here. Uh, we developed, or Robin and a group developed the accredited permaculture training, and we started training people full time, had students coming and living on site. And um, during those years, Robin would be invited overseas to, she went to the Amazon for a um, International Permaculture Convergence. She also went to Cuba um, a few times during those years. I don't think there's probably anybody else in the country who's done so much to contribute to the enhancement of permaculture beyond it being a fairly wishy-washy um, set of ideas, hippie ideas if you like, and don't get me wrong, I don't have a negative take on, on the word hippie, but so she's really raised the, 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 the quality of permaculture education um, as, a, as a really significant part of her contribution to permaculture, not only in Australia, but internationally. Working at Jambung is the closest I get to a spiritual experience and living it in the real world. When I go back, it doesn't matter whether I'm feeding the chickens or uptown putting out flyers and stuff for the next course or helping mow the lawns. I just feel privileged to be part of a bigger and better vision for the world that she's got. You know, one of the things that I've, I've always seen as the, the major shortcoming of permaculture is not enough active examples of it applied in action. And that's what makes this place so precious. Not simply as a productive piece of land, but as a dynamic example that can be used in many, many different ways to demonstrate what permaculture represents. And in addition to growing food in permaculture, we grow fibre plants and craft plants. And these are my uh, beautiful hard skin gourds. There's some little bottle gourds here. Uh, it's an ancient gourd. Uh, this is called the bird gourd. And so I'm going to make a little bird house with this. Just um, uh, finalise that. Knowing a bit about your plant families uh, uh, is really important for a number of reasons, for crop rotation, um, but also knowing how they pollinate um, uh, is uh, critical for seed saving. So in my um, seeds here are actually organised by family. Yeah. Then there's the brassicas, the brassicaceae, that's a big, lots of, lots of stuff in there. So these are all our homegrown seeds, uh, mizunas and radishes and daikons. Saving our own seed is essential to food security. Seed sovereignty is the other side of the coin of food security. 
We can't have food security without owning and saving our own seeds. And so many of the seeds that farmers are now depending on for crops are hybrids and, and, and also GM, where they are depending on buying those seeds every year. And the old traditional open, um, we call them uh, open pollinated varieties, like this carrot here. Each year that I'm growing them, they are adapting better to my soil. Actually, these seeds are from a, a carrot that I planted two years ago. And this particular plant survived right through the drought. So it's really resilient. The word sustainable is very useful and sustainability, but it is open to all sorts of interpretations. What is it that you want to sustain? In permaculture, we like to think about regenerating and sustainability being that midpoint between degenerative and regenerative systems. I mean, it's um, relatively easy to design for the plants and the animals and the buildings and the infrastructure and the water, uh, but um, designing for people is where the big challenge is. And working with communities, helping them or facilitating them finding their own solutions, uh, I've, I think is one of the most powerful things we can do is people have the answers, they just don't have the courage. And when you can bring our minds together to really address finding solutions with the resources that they have and that are available, uh, magic happens. Celery and 
long reddish nuts from macadamia and something from Tasmania. Subversion from Tasmania. Permaculture. Manic mulchers. Green Gorilla Gang said, what a knock. Let's just go and plant another free food pot. So they saved all the seeds from the veggies that they ate and dried them in the sun on an old paper plate. 